Earth. You got a copy? Earth? I don't know if you've had your coffee and correct grammar yet this morning. But if you haven't, let's get some in you. I definitely have my coffee. I was toying with the idea of doing a another comments video because I've received so many comments from so many fine folks on the slander video I did where the Syntax Learning Center colon Joey hyphen John colon Lester was calling me a bad, bad, bad guy that I had enough material to do another comments video. But I just did one a couple days ago. So I figured, oh, why don't I just come on and pick one topic and do a coffee and correct grammar video because I haven't done one of these in a while. I'll live stream it. And then if a conversation develops in the chat about grammar or about whatever, then that's cool too. That's additional value and material to this. And then I will take this video this live video, put it over in the members section, and then I will edit this video and make another version of it, uh, only putting in the pertinent grammar info and then publish it to the public in a more concise form, efficient form. So that's my plan anyways. So today I'm going to talk about something that well, it, it comes from a comment from a Russell J. Gould cult follower named M. Period Wills. And they, which is the case with many of these people, have no idea of my history with Russell J. Gould and his construct and his people. Um, they brought up the point of when I say a vowel in front of a consonant means no, they ask, do I have closure on that? <laughs> Again, when I come on to someone else's vessel and I have the nerve or whatever to comment, I'm not going to come on and not be prepared. All right. I don't. Just like if you walk into a foreign vessel and dry dock, or if you walk into a government facility or military installation, whatever it is, you have to be prepared. You have to know. You have to be prepared here and here to hold a position. This guy or girl didn't do their homework. I have multiple videos on this YouTube channel talking about why a vowel in front of a consonant means no, looking at it from different angles. The most important one being for the closure and clarity of the two specific syntax scenarios, part two. Part one is good too, but part two is the one where I really go into detail on why one vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word means no. Now, if you remember back in the day, Colin David Ivan Wynn Colin Miller used to say, a single syllable vowel in, uh, at the beginning of a word means no, and a vowel in front of two consonants means no. Well, that seemed a little inconsistent to me based only upon uh, etymological evidence, which etym etymological evidence is a very strong continuance of evidence, yes, but there's more to it than that. There's a deeper closure that one can get if one again does the homework and does the research which i have done so this led me to the closure and conclusion that a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word means no no matter how many uh, consonants it's followed by no matter if it's a single syllable vowel or not it means no and I go into a great depth of closure on that in the video that I mentioned before. But I'm going to do it again here. Um, 
I'm going to show it again here. So I'm just going to read a little bit from this uh, individual's comment. And again, you know, they, they talk in that, that quantum gobbledygook mishmash of quasi-correct sentence structure in plain English. It's very, very hard to understand what the hell people like this are saying. That's why I came to the conclusion long, long ago, if you don't know correct sentence structure, just use plain English to the best of your knowledge. We were all raised, well, English-speaking people were all raised to speak plain English. So it's not that hard to just open your mouth and use plain English to say what you want to say, if it is your volition to be comprehended, if it's your volition to be understood, if it's your volition to confuse people, by all means, use this BS. So I'm just going to try and give you my interpretation of their quantum gobbledygook. So it has colon space is, which means of the. So that tells me right away they don't have closure on the grammar. And it's typical of the Russell J. Gould cult followers because they don't have closure on the grammar because he doesn't. Well, he doesn't show evidence of having closure on the grammar. None of his documents show it. Whether he does or doesn't, you know, actually literally in real life, I, I don't know. I've never confronted the guy on a face-to-face -face basis and been able to test him to see if he has closure or not. All I have is a continuance of the evidence of the documents that he's published. And based upon that, in those documents, he, he shows no evidence of having 100% closure on the grammar. So they say, is of, <laughs> of the is of your authority closure in the red type on the vowel, on the vowel, with the consonant following of the full closure on the principle with the meaning no. So that's definitely not a correct sentence structure. It doesn't close with an authority, and it uses a, a positional on, which what's congruent with on? Off. So reading that backwards, you would have to say, of the meaning no, out the principle, with the full closure, of the consonant following, out the vowel, off the red type, with your authority closure, with the is. It's like a morass of terrible, terrible, terrible grammar. But they're basically asking me, do I have full closure on that? And this is what I'm talking about, having a position, having knowledge before you step into a venue. This individual obviously doesn't. That's why their comment is not getting published. And that's why I'm going to publish this in a comments video, but I'm going to address this uh, point because they go on to say how can you communicate with the use of the words is of are in at etc again the individual hasn't done their homework so i'll just answer the question for them right here right now how can we use words like is of are why well, don't use the word on buddy because on is not a, a positional there are only four positionals, for, of, with, and by. And I don't use at and I don't use in. Those are all no contract, no positional, no congruency, no mathematical interface for those words, which you would know if you had closure on the grammar, but you don't. So I can cut you some slack. So anyway, is, of, are, and, or. How can we use those words in correct sentence structure if it's a vowel in front of a consonant? What I say and the way I teach it is that you would not use a particle of negation in your facts, meaning you would not use a vowel in front of a consonant in your fact. Is and are are not facts. They're verbs. Of is not a fact. It's a positional. And and or are not facts. They're conjunctions. That's why. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you had a depth, a deeper depth of closure, you would know this. 
and you would go back and watch the videos and you would hear me say, we don't use particles of negation in our facts. I say it over and over and over again. The regular watchers and viewers of my channel are probably sick of me saying that. But that's why you can use words like is, are, of, and, and, or. Because they're not facts. They have different functions which are designated in the styles, in your correct sentence structure styles manual. Or they ought to be designated in your styles manual, which is included in your dictionary. If you're going to be writing correct sentence structure contract, you got to have a correct live life claim. you got to have a dictionary. Your dictionary. You being the author of that dictionary means you have authority on it. If someone else wrote the dictionary, then they have authority over your grammar. You see what I'm saying? See how that works? Simple logic. So uh, then he says, your comprehension of the lesson point is with the shortfall then, correct? They must be speaking about themselves. So they go on to say that an example being the words a at attention asymmetrical. Only the third and fourth words have a particle of negation. A at attention asymmetrical. This individual is saying that only these words have a particle of negation because it's a single syllable vowel at the beginning of the word. But these do not contain particles of negation. This individual has just shown me that they don't have closure on syntax. They don't know how to syntax. Because I'm going to show you why this means no, this means no, this means no, and this means no. It's consistent across the board. There are no exceptions. It's one and one is one. So I'll show you. I will show you what I'm talking about here. Just a minute, I'm syntaxing these words. Okay, when you take these words and you separate the letters and turn each letter into individual component, you can then syntax them. If you do your research, and one of the ways to do that would be go back and watch that video I suggested for the closure and clarity of the two specific syntax scenarios, part two, you will see that vowels, and you can look at David Wynn Miller videos, he says this as well, vowels when you when you look them up and parse them and all that, they are syntaxed as non-tangible contract. And consonants are syntaxed as tangible contract. So vowels are going to be syntaxed as either adverbs, verbs, or pronouns. And consonants are either going to be syntaxed as verbs, adjectives, or pronouns. So as you see here, A is a standalone pronoun, but it's non-tangible contract. A-T is adverb dangling participle verb. A has a non-tangible condition of state. Same thing here. A-T-E, N-T-I-O-N, adverb, adjective, pronoun, adverb, adjective, adjective, pronoun, adverb, dangling, participle verb. I, I don't know if this is backwards to you or not. I apologize if it is. Um, but, you know, so on and so forth. This is why... The vowel in front of a consonant means no because it's an adverbial type of thinking. It comes across as non-tangible. Okay? That is why a vowel in front of a consonant means no at the beginning of a word. 
Because you're putting thinking before there's something to think about. That is why a vowel in front of a consonant means no at the beginning of a word. Now, if you have two vowels in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word, the first vowel performs the function of what we would call the life force. And again, you can go back to that closure and clarity of the two specific syntax scenarios for more detailed closure on this. I go into great depth of closure on that. It's already there. So it's there if you want to go look at it. Um, so the best example I can give is if you have two vowels in front of a consonant, the first vowel being the life force, the second vowel being the thinking, if you're thinking about the life force, you have something to think about now. Because try to navigate without thinking. It doesn't work. But you have to have something to think about. And it's the life force. That's why those two vowels in front of the consonant words are so powerful and so potent where it seemed to be. Like A-U. It's because they start with the life force, then the thinking, then you go into the consonants. It's... It's a depth of closure that people like M. Wills have never heretofore ever gone to. Let me look something up real quick. Okay. One of my favorite and most hardworking students uh, and I had a discussion about this. Uh, about diving and about a condition of state known as the bends, or it's also referred to as caisson sickness or decompression sickness. But what I'm talking about with regards to an analogy to correct sentence structure is you get the bends when you go to a depth of, of that when you're diving and you go to a depth that is, you know, it's too much for you. You've gone too deep you start having a weird type of mental condition of state where you start thinking that you don't need a breathing apparatus and you can just swim and breathe in the water. You start losing your mind basically um, when you go too deep. That's why you have to bring a diving partner with you because when the diving partner sees you doing that, they can grab you. And the, and the solution to this problem is to just take the person who's experiencing the bends and take them to a, shallower depth and then their equilibrium equilibrium restores and then they're fine it's the same thing with this cramp i find that when you take people to a depth they're not comfortable with or they get into a depth that they're not used to they start acting erratic they start acting weird you know they start getting defensive they start getting angry and you know you have to bring them back to the shallow water real quick um, so that they can retain their or, or remaster their equilibrium. They get confused. That's sort of like what goes on here. And that's the other thing about these Russell J. Gould cult followers. I understand the urge to want to come here when they see someone criticizing their lord and master's grammar they get all defensive about it they start saying like there's this guy that claims to be some sort of judge or something i think his name is marcel lyra or something he's been coming on and off here you know every so often over the past few years he claims to be some sort of federal postal judge i think or something like that i guess he knew david Wynn miller and russell maybe i don't know I do know that Ru he's another one of the people that Russell disqualified or something at some point. I don't know where he is on Russell's popularity list these days. But he comes on and he says, he tells me that I should stick to teaching. And that uh, I should stop criticizing Russell and focus on the more important things. It's funny that, that someone like that would come here and say that to me. But yet when they hear Joey John Lester slandering me, they're not going to go on to, you know, Joey John Lester and say, 
quit slandering that guy. Why are you slandering that guy? Why, why do you say he's bad? Why is he bad? What's he doing that's bad? Teaching grammar? Teaching correct grammar? I guess that's bad for Joey because Joey doesn't teach correct grammar. But you see what I'm saying? It's like a, it's like a protagonist-centered morality. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. I'm not slandering anyone. I'm just pointing out incorrect grammar. So now suddenly, it's not okay to point out incorrect grammar. Now I should just focus on the bigger picture. When what's the whole premise behind the Russell J. Gould, David W. Miller construct? Pointing out incorrect grammar. Pointing out the fiction system using a fictitious conveyance of grammar, grammar with modification and blah, 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 blah. That's the same thing I'm doing. But now, because of who it is that I'm pointing it out about, people are getting their panties in a bunch. <laughs> Ooh, don't criticize our hero. Well, I'm not really criticizing your hero per se. I'm criticizing the grammar. I've just given closure right here, right now. Free of charge. Why a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word means no. It comes down to the syntax, and it comes down to parsing, and it comes down to credentialing whether a particle is tangible or non-tangible contract. It's easy. This has leveled the field of grammar, this concept. That full colon, raven, hyphen, farhad, hyphen, tohiti, colon, efferin, and myself established. It's established a consistent baseline that people can come to so that your syntax is the same as my syntax. There is no guessing. All right. It's a mechanic that everyone can share. In, and it's here on this channel for free. Talked about ad nauseum. We don't need a piece of paper with a list of adverbs. Because there is no such thing. Why do I say that? Glad you asked. Since no one out there is going to ask any grammar questions, I'll ask myself the grammar questions. So one, one of the things that those people are fond of doing is going into a sentence. And the first thing they do is pick out the word the anywhere in the sentence. And they put a one above it. Saying that it's an adverb because the is on their list of adverbs. So let me write out a little sentence here. So the first sentence is, it's the darndest thing. And the second sentence is, it's the, the darndest thing. How would you syntax these sentences? The way the uh, Syntax Learning Center would do it, or Russell J. Gould would do it, would just come in and put a one above this the, and put a one above this the, and put a one above this the, and then try to force the syntax around it to fit the ones. Okay, which is not correct. That's a violation of rule one, rule equal, violation of judge mechanics, because you have to take the whole scenario into account, into consideration before you can pass a judgment on something. So you have to look at the whole sentence in order to do that. So I'm going to put. Uh, the ones here and I'm going to syntax them. Uh, the way that those people would do it. Or as close approximation to the way I think they would do it. Back. So this is how they would probably syntax this sentence. 41134. Pronoun, adverb, adverb, adjective, pronoun. But how can an adverb modify another adverb? If you watch the parts of speech video that I did on the adverb, 
I show quite clearly that that can't happen, that it wouldn't happen. Because an adverb is less than a non-tangible condition of state. So an adverb would only modify a tangible contract adjective or a verb. It could not modify another adverb in the same way that an adjective can modify another adjective. Adjectives can modify other adjectives because they're tangible. They're substantive. They're constant. So when you have a series of adjectives, you can just three, 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 and then the last one's going to be a four. But you can't do that with adverbs because of their condition of state. As I showed earlier when I was syntaxing the vowels and the pardon me, the vowels and the consonants. So I'm going to show you the correct way to syntax these. This would be four, one, three, four. This would be one, two, one, three, four. Non-tangible contract, non-tangible contract, non-tangible contract, tangible contract. And then the pronoun thing ends that series. So as you can see here, the is a verb in this scenario. So check this out. If you go on to a document and you see the word the and you put a one above it, how would you syntax this? Syntax Learning Center. What would this be? Right here. Is this an adverb? Would you put a one above this? No, you wouldn't. Because any word standing by itself is a pronoun. So here's evidence against what you're being taught over there. This is a pronoun. It could not be an adverb because it's not modifying anything. An adverb is a modifier. And this is not modifying anything. So it can't be an adverb. The, the, the. Is this three adverbs? No, it's not. It's a 412, a pronoun, adverb, dangling, participle verb. This is what I'm talking about. They don't know how to syntax correctly. I just gave closure as to how you would do that. And there's a whole plethora of videos on my syntax playlist. So although we didn't get any grammar questions here, I hope this helps some people with their closure on a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word and why that means no. No matter how, you know, what the scenario is, there are no exceptions. Check out the other video I was talking about, two uh, closure and clarity on the two specific syntax scenarios, part two and also part one. And thanks for joining me. Catch you next time. I'm out. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like, and I'll do the same, and we'll see if this is something that uh, you're prepared to commit to. If you'd like to support the channel, click on the Join button underneath this video. There are two tiers of membership. Uh, the second tier has access to exclusive content not available to the public. Once again, thank you for watching. Uh, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Turn the notification bell to all so that you don't miss any of my premieres because I do post on a very consistent basis. There are over 500 correct sentence structure videos for here you to study on this channel. My gift to you, my fellow mankind. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one.